obviously you don't want your your view on religion su summarized by it's good for stupid people well i do i do want it summarized to some degree that way because well, one of the things yes, we do yeah, i'm giving you not, the opportunity again to put well, this foot in your mouth but but, but, but yes. i would only, i would say not not only I mean, the thing is, is that we're all stupid, and and some of us are far stupider than others. But, but we're not. But and, we're not that stupid. I mean, well, well, <laughs> but what, there's another problem, Sam. I, I think, and 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 th this is obviously a contentious one. And one of the things I I don't go to church, but there is one thing I admire about the church, and that is that it's managed to serve as a repository for these fundamental underlying fictions for two millennia. And that's really something bloody unbelievable. I mean, the great, um, what would you say? It is bloody unbelievable. Well, look, yeah. Sam, there, everything's, everything's, everything's soaked in blood. Good morning. It is Sunday. Thank God it's Sunday, May the 28th. And this is the True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the Star Spangled Banner, we will have Donald Trump, Bishop Barron, and three selections from the Thomistic Institute. All that and more when I get back. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and remove your hands for the national anthem of the United States of America. Thank you, thank you. Who is the liberal? He is the man that seeks consensus. He is subjective, petty, and small, taking everything in life personally. He's outrageous, boring, and rude. He pretends to be a leader and a change agent. He pretends that he's your friend. He is sly, cunning, and deceptive. He dresses, acts, and speaks like a slob. He's informal and terminally unique. He's childish and pretends that he knows nothing. He has no conscience and pretends that might makes right and that the ends justify the means. He is impulsive and rationalizes his behavior. He is deterministic, blaming others for his mistakes. He is skeptical, demanding that others solve his problems. His unreasonableness and irresponsibility make him a bad role model, bad father, brother, family member, friend, and a bad person, period. So if you think that you can be friends with a socialist, think again. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. And now a few words from Donald Trump. As you gather with family and friends this weekend, everything is more expensive, a lot more expensive, actually, because of Joe Biden's reckless policies that have caused soaring energy costs and currency inflation like our country hasn't seen for over 50 years. This Memorial Day gas prices are up 48 percent since Joe took office. That's right. 48 percent. Food prices are up 18 percent. Airline prices are up 41 percent. Taxes are higher than ever. Interest rates for mortgages and car loans have put the American dream out of reach for countless millions of families. Meanwhile, in the Joe Biden economy, real wages are down 25 months in a row. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. In fact, it's the longest streak on record. The typical American family this Memorial Day weekend has lost an average of nearly $7,000 a year in purchasing power because of Joe Biden's failed presidency. You could take the worst five presidents in history, and they haven't done the damage that Joe Biden has done. Just add them up. But help is on the way. On day one, I will begin to reverse the disastrous effects of Biden's inflation and rebuild the greatest economy in the history of the world, which is what we had. I will unleash energy independence and we will bring the price of gasoline down immediately by ending Biden's foolish war on American energy. They don't want to drill. They don't want to get that liquid gold. We have more than anybody, but we're going to get it. and We're going to bring those prices way down. This will also put immediate downward pressure on food prices and the cost of living. By Memorial Day 2025, our country will be roaring back We'll be well on our way to greatness like our country has never seen before. We were doing it, and then it got stopped by some horrible policies. We had horrible, horrible policies. They all happened so quickly. Not only will we be energy independent, but we will soon be energy dominant. We'll be making so much money, so much, that we'll be reducing debt and lowering your taxes doing so many different things. Our country will be great again. I promise. Thank you very much. And that was uh, Donald Trump. Back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. And now from the Thomistic Institute. An evil action without it being a sin? Well, yes, although what we mean by that has to be qualified. For instance, there are evils that can come about by non-rational actions of the body. For instance, a heart attack can result from a blockage in the arteries. This is an evil, and the attack comes about from the lack of proper action in the body. This is not a sin on your part, but it is an evil insofar as it harms you. Or another example is that of cancer. Cancer is often the result of cells in the body that grow out of control in such a way as to harm the body. This is evil and is the action of parts of your body, but is not a sin on your part. It is easy to see why actions that are not voluntary can be evil but not sin. But can an action be voluntary and evil but not a sin? I think so. Here's an example. Let's say it is a hot day and I want to cool down by drinking a milkshake. I take a sip of the milkshake and then undergo brain freeze. Brain freeze is painful, and so is an evil, albeit a mild form of evil. My action, sipping the milkshake, caused a minor evil, but it was not a sin. Thank you, thank you. And now, uh, again, from the Thomistic Institute. We have hope if things seem to be going so wrong. The first thing to remember is that our hope, Christian hope, is in the promises of God. Those promises are going to be fulfilled at the general resurrection when there is a new heaven and a new earth. And so St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us that our hope must be focused on the life to come. He writes, quote, We ought not to pray God for any other goods except in reference to eternal happiness. Hence, hope regards eternal happiness chiefly and other things for which we pray God it regards secondarily and as referred to eternal happiness. Just as faith regards God principally and secondarily, those things which are referred to God. That is an important principle for us to remember. 
Our hope must be in the promises of God alone and not in the present world. Thank you, thank you. And yet another episode of the Thomistic Institute. The Church's sacraments were instituted by Jesus Christ himself for the needs of our salvation. But someone may ask, what about confirmation? Or what about the anointing of the sick? Did Christ confirm? Did he anoint? St. Thomas says that Christ promised confirmation through the sending of the Holy Spirit. And we read that by Christ's institution, the apostles healed the sick by anointing them with oil. All the sacraments come from the Lord himself. And in different ways, the Bible gives witness to all of them. In conclusion, in exploring the question, are the sacraments biblical? We can see that the Bible points us to Christ and those sacraments in which we meet him during our lives on earth. Through the sacraments, the words of love, life, and mercy that we read in the Bible are fulfilled in particular actions in our lives, here and now. In heaven, we will not be reading the Bible, nor will we be receiving the sacraments. But now is the time to live the fullness of grace through the sacraments instituted by Jesus Christ, described in the Bible and ministered in the church for our everlasting salvation. And that was the uh, Thomistic Institute. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Barron. Peace be with you. Friends, we come to this great feast of Pentecost, the culmination of the Easter season, the feast that along with Easter and Christmas is the most important in the church year, and a sort of par excellence, the feast of the Holy Spirit. I don't think we talk enough about the Holy Spirit. That's a critique, by the way, of, of the Western church, of the Catholic church, that even though, of course, we mention and we honor and we worship the Holy Spirit, that we don't speak sufficiently of this third person of the Trinity. And there might be some truth to that. Vatican II, I think, tried to bring the Holy Spirit very much into the forefront. So I want to continue in that spirit. All three readings today are are marvelous. I want to just dip in briefly to each one and bring out some features of the Holy Spirit. Listen now, our first reading is from that second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, the famous account of the first Pentecost. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together, they, the the disciples and, and the Blessed Mother, Suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house where they were. So the wind, the wind, a great symbol of the Holy Spirit. Mysterious? You bet. You know, where does it come from? Where is it going? As Jesus himself said, we don't always know. The wind is strange, mysterious, elusive, unpredictable, and powerful. There's the point, I think. Powerful. See, when you get in touch with the Holy Spirit, You're getting in touch with the love that connects the Father and the Son. You're getting in touch with the love that God is, and therefore with the very force that gave rise to the universe. So at the risk of sounding a little bit cosmic and grandiose, you're in touch with the most powerful force imaginable. Where do we see it? We see it in the lives of the saints, you know, we can talk about politicians and generals and, and cultural leaders as powerful, and indeed they are. Think of a Julius Caesar or a Napoleon. Or, but they're nothing, nothing when compared with the power of the saints. Because worldly rulers are going to use, you know, weapons and they're going to use political machinations. And, and sure, those are powerful forces. But they're nothing compared to the power by which the entire universe is created and sustained. And the great saints, in the measure that they cooperate with the Holy Spirit, tap into and unleash this power. You know, examples abound. But I I always think of John Paul II in Poland, because it happened in in my lifetime in the most extraordinary way, where this man who didn't have an army, didn't have tanks or guns or anything, had no political power in the ordinary sense of the term. But by God, he had the Holy Spirit. And tapping into that spirit, he unleashed a power that did indeed undo the Soviet Union and and the block of nations that surrounded it. Nobody, when I was a young man, nobody 
would have predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse without some great cataclysmic world war. And yet it happened because somebody who was deeply in touch with the Holy Spirit unleashed that great wind, that great power. Or think of a, you know, Mother Teresa in a somewhat different context. But Mother Teresa, this tiny lady, this simple uh, woman with no power whatsoever in a worldly sense, but she had the Holy Spirit. She cooperated with the Holy Spirit and unleashed this force. Now it covers the whole world, the community that she founded. It's true of all the saints. So here's the thing, everybody listening to me today. You want power. And I don't mean the, the you know, little power of the world. I mean the real thing. You want the real thing, authentic power. Surrender your life over to the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, it, look, it's not what I want. It's not my projects and plans. It's your projects and plans. Lord, it's what you want to accomplish through me. You will find, trust me, you will find, you will tap into this source of power to change things for good, change things for the better in your life, in your family, in your place of work. Surrender by a conscious act to the Spirit, and you unleash this great driving wind. Same thing. And then secondly, we hear, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. Tongues as of fire. So fire is a, is a symbol of the Spirit, obviously. Fire which destroys what needs destroying. Fire that, that also unleashes extraordinary power. I sensed that when I was in California and these great, these great, uh, um, fires swept through, you know, forests and swept through communities. But the important thing here, I think, is not just fire. It's tongues as a fire. One of the marks of the Holy Spirit, power, yes, indeed, but also fiery speech. Fiery speech is a mark of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is from Paul through Chrysostom and Jerome and Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas and Ignatius and G.K. Chesterton and John Paul II and the Little Flower and Teresa of Avila. Words, the power of words, fiery speech. I don't mean the sort of mewling speech of a child or sort of hand-wringing speech or I got more questions than answers. I mean... Bore me to death with all that. I, I grew up with that, a church that was too preoccupied with all of its questions and all of its hesitations. No, no. When you got the Holy Spirit in you, fiery speech tends to come forth from you. Words about the Lord, words about Jesus, words about the church that are meant to set the world on fire. Think of Fulton Sheen um, in the 20th century. You know, his fiery words changed people's hearts and lives by the millions. That's what the Holy Spirit does, fiery speech. Now, as we go on in this marvelous passage, we hear this. There were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem because it was the Jewish feast of Pentecost, right? At this sound, they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard the disciples speaking in his own language. So this famous phenomenon of the first Pentecost, the disciples go out full of power, full of fiery speech, and all these Jews from all over the world nevertheless heard them speaking in his own language. It's the undoing of Babel, isn't it? The Tower of Babel, when human speech was divided, were set apart from each other, separated, scattered. In this great act of Pentecost, this great day of Pentecost, the speech of the world is united. Now, it doesn't mean, obviously, that now all particular languages are eliminated. But see, it means something deeper, more important. It means that when you speak of the Holy Spirit and the things of God, you are communicating with the deepest part of the person you're talking to. You know, you talk about the weather, you talk about sports teams, but and, and you know, so what? But when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, when you're when your tongue is on fire with the power of the Spirit, you will trust me, reach the deepest part of the person you're talking to. Same the other way, when he or she speaks of the Holy Spirit, it will resonate in the deepest part of you. See, deep down, despite all the differences on the surface, we all do indeed speak the same language. 
because we come forth from the same source, from the Holy Spirit. That's the point here, I think, everybody. And look at this. I love this detail when the author of Acts, St. Luke, bothers to tell us where all these people are from. They're Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians. They're from Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, near Cyrene, even travelers as far as Rome. Now, if I had a map, I could show this to you. Think of of Jerusalem here right in the middle where this is happening. The countries and places he's describing form a kind of ellipse around Jerusalem. If, If you were to just take them one by one, like an ellipse that surrounds Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit is a gathering power because the diabolic, as I told you before, diabolain in Greek means to scatter. And so, ha diabolos, the devil, the devil is a scattering power. You know the Holy Spirit is in you. You know the Holy Spirit's around when people start coming together. Remember now in the prophet Isaiah, in the day of the Messiah, Isaiah prophesies. All the tribes of Israel will go up to Mount Zion. But then, but then he says, even all the tribes of the world will come together. You see what Luke is saying? It's happened. It's happened. Here they are at Mount Zion. Here they are in Jerusalem. And through the power of the Spirit, all these nations, once scattered, come together around this central place. And the many languages, in a way, they're eliminated because the one great language of the Spirit's being spoken. Do you want the one of the clearest signs the Holy Spirit's operative? Look for gathering and unifying power. You want the diabolic, the dark spirit? Scattering. Scattering power. That's what's happening on the day of Pentecost through the power of the Spirit. How about a quick word about um, marvelous second reading from First Corinthians, which is such a marvelous letter. Paul says this, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit, capital S. Different forms of service, but the same Lord. Different workings, but the same God. Again, there's the unifying gathering quality. I love how the church fathers played with this image. They often compared the Holy Spirit to rainwater. Think of the rainwater that falls. It's just one element, water falling from the sky. But look what it gives rise to. Think of all of the plants and all of the flowers and all of the trees in their practically infinite variety to which the one rain gives rise. So, so the one spirit. Yes, indeed, the one spirit, the love that connects the father and the son is breathed forth into the world. What does it give rise to? Think now, all the different types of saints. Think of all the different types of activities in the church. Think of across space and time, all the ways the church has expressed its life. The, the, the fecund variety of, of holiness. Well, those are the many flowers and plants and trees to which the one spirit gives rise. And then this, I'll close with it. There's so much more to say. I always run out of time when talking about the Holy Spirit. There's so much to say. Listen, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. Go back to Paul's time, the first century. Eastern Mediterranean. These are are two of the most fundamental divisions in the human family. They would have referred to Jews and Greeks or Jews and Gentiles. It's two groups. It's one of the most basic ways they kind of oriented themselves. What are are you, a Jew or a Gentile, Jew or Greek? See what Paul is saying is something new has happened so that those divisions and separations don't really matter. Because whether you're Jew or Greek, you've got the one spirit in you. And then maybe even more radically, slave or free person. Again, in his time and place, one of the most fundamental divisions you could find. You know, slaves were very thick on the ground in Paul's time. Millions and millions of slaves. 
there's, there's a fundamental division. Paul's saying, well, but they share in the one spirit. And so what unites them is far, far more important than even this most basic division. Can I make this remark? I think N.T. Wright might have said this, or maybe it was Tom Holland, that Paul is, is planting a sort of time bomb here. In time, this idea, radical, radical idea, would give rise to, to liberation movements, including and especially the abolition of slavery. But see, I would argue in the West, it begins with a text like this. The Holy Spirit is more fundamental than anything that divides us. There's the unifying power of the Spirit. Again, everybody, much more we could say. But savor today this great feast of Pentecost. And bottom line, in prayer today, 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 open yourself to the Holy Spirit. I think you'll be surprised at the power you thereby unleash. And God bless you. And that was Bishop Barron. Lord Rush Limbaugh's on by the Rush Hawkins Singers is exactly what's called for. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. So I'm reminding you that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.